thanks. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, before we dive in, I want to acknowledge that uh, Sarah, Sharon, your teams are very different stakeholders coming from a city and then the healthcare industry. Uh, so your net zero declarations, influences, roadmaps, they'll look very different uh, because your pain points, priorities, and decarbonization levers that you have control over will vary. So throughout this presentation, I'll attempt to make this conversation relevant to both parties, but at times I'm I'm going to have to talk about one or the other. So uh, just bear with me through those. Um, on this slide, we cover some of the net zero basics. So the foundational pieces of what is net zero. Put simply, net zero means cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible with any remaining emissions that can't be eliminated, abated via offsets, nat nature-based solutions or the like. So why is net zero important? Uh, IPCC, IPCC's science shows clearly that in order to avert the world's impacts of climate change and preserve a livable planet for future generations, global temperatures in, global temperature increase needs to be limited to one and a half degrees C. Currently, the Earth is already about 1 and 1.1 degrees C, warmer than uh, the late 1800s, and emissions continue to rise due to increasing populations um, and not scaled renewable technologies. I can tell you the tone from COP this year was a bit defeated given the progress on global parties uh, implementation. To keep global warming to no more than one and a half degrees C, global emissions will need to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. So how can we do that? And we'll talk a lot about that today. Transitioning to a net zero world is one of the greatest challenges uh, the world has ever faced. It calls for nothing less than a complete transformation of how we produce, consume, and move about from a transportation perspective. Replacing polluting coal, gas, and oil-fired power with energy from renewable sources such as wind, hydrogen, and solar, all promising renewable technologies here in Louisiana, would dramatically reduce carbon emissions. But there's a total mentality shift in what we value as quality of living. I can tell you there's a definite generational divide working in this field, even here in Louisiana, over what my parents and my grandparents see as viable and sustainable living versus what I or my peers see as viable and sustainable living. So achieving net zero is as much a social issue as it is a scientific one. And we'll talk about some of the key levers for yourselves in a net zero plan today. The good news is that there is a global effort to reach net zero. There's an ever-growing coalition of countries, cities, businesses, and other institutions pledging to get to net zero emissions. More than 70 countries, including the biggest polluters, uh, China being one of the most recent, the United States and the, the EU collectively, have set net zero targets covering about 76% of global emissions. And then from a city perspective, more than 1,000 cities, over 1,000 educational in institutions, and over 400 financial institutions have also joined the race to net zero. The importance for cities to transition is an ever-growing notion. Today, only about 55% of the world's population live in urban areas, but as I'm sure you're well aware, a, a proportion that is expected to, this is a, a proportion that's expected to increase by up to 68% by 2050. Projections show that urbanization, the gradual shift in residents of the human population from rural to urban areas, combined with the overall growth of the world's population, could add another two and a half billion people to urban areas by 2050 with close to 90% of this increase taking place in Asia and Africa. According to the United Nations data, data that was launched today, um, if we were to continue as it were, without this mental shift I was referring to, there's no way that we would maintain the one and a half degree C limit, um, which will ensure future generations have the same type of quality of living and environmental benefits that we have today. For the Oshner crowd worldwide, the healthcare sector is responsible for approximately 4.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions, which includes carbon dioxide, methane, and other carbon intensive gases, and some that are specific to healthcare. In the United States, the share of emissions is closer to around 85 to 9% for healthcare. Over recent years, uh, so between 2010 and 2018, healthcare systems were shown to be increasing in emissions instead of decreasing in emissions. Um, obviously, these emissions exacerbate climate change and its negative health impacts, which is contrary to the very nature of your industry and hospitals to help save lives and preserve the quality of life. So in summary, 
net zero is not an option if we want to preserve the quality of climate for future generations. It's a necessity and one that we need to commit to quickly. So what is our current status? Um, starting with New Orleans, I hope this information is useful to set the local stage, um, maybe for the Oshner folks. I'm sure the city attendees have uh, this information on hand and I know Megan herself contributed to the climate action plan that's shown on the screen, um, but hopefully this context helps in terms of what's being done you know, from a local perspective. The city of New Orleans has been a C40 city since 2006 and is one of 96 member cities currently enrolled. The C40 coalition's mission is to have the emissions of its member cities while improving equity building resilience and creating the conditions for everyone everywhere to thrive. Mayors of C40 cities are on the leading edge of climate action and deploy science-based, very key words, and collaborative approaches to help the world limit global heating to one and a half degrees C. The city of New Orleans launched its first climate action plan back in 2017 and recently updated it with a release this very month. In the climate action plan, the city lays out numerous initiatives to achieve redu reductions, focusing on five key points which you can see on the screen here are to ramp up local climate action, uh, improving transportation, improving energy, uh, improving waste uh, collection and disposal, and then nature-based solutions and adaptation. Like any other city, the mayor's office is limited in their powers and faces different barriers, such as funding, policy setting, and enforcement. Um, and, you know, general influence in practice adoption of more sustainable living is is obviously beyond the, the mayor's, uh, the city's ability to implement, but um, playing a key role in that policy setting and uh, promotional, you know, media promotion and things like that is definitely within the realm of, of possibility. Additionally, while the city has a dedicated resource team, um, keeping up with the latest policies for reductions and offsetting can be very daunting. Um, I can tell you COP was nothing like I expected in terms of the uh, the level of information that was available, that uh, it was extremely hard to navigate new announcements and you know major policy initiatives. So even especially at the local level, it can be very difficult to keep up with um, you know what what's coming out from louisiana's climate action plan let alone what's happening in the ira and and globally so i think this resource bolstering to your team uh information sharing and out of the box thinking from exposure to other sectors cities industries and countries is where strategic partnerships may have the most effect for new orleans so for instance while we've exploited oil and gas for a very long time in louisiana and benefited from its availability Louisiana is also rich in nature and ecology, and as global frameworks for nature-based solutions, biodiversity and conservation continue to evolve, such as what's been happening at the UN's Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal this week. Innovative thinking on an investment in nature and leveraging its economic, social, and climate benefits may play an even bigger role in the city's net zero journey than is currently laid out. Uh, the current climate action plan largely focuses on leveraging trees uh, for a wide variety of benefits and co-benefits. So I think it would be fruitful to keep an eye out not only on the outcomes of COP15 happening in Montreal, but also potential carbon crediting programs, which I believe Colleen, uh, sorry, Pauline um, from Obatable will talk about in just a bit. So moving on to Oshner, Sarah, I'm I'm really not sure of the status or maturity of Oshner's um, like net zero declarations or or emissions. It, it, I, I just looked online and didn't see much, but do you have any insights no, for we, me? <laughs> we haven't made a commitment yet. Okay. I great. didn't know ERM had a uh, office in Metairie, so yeah, <laughs> I, right we down have some right. more. I think we can have some more conversations after this. <laughs> Wonderful. <It's great laughs> yes, we don't have a commitment yet. We are doing our GHG baseline right now, so that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, we should actually so, have it done by um, the first quarter of next year. So okay, we're, we're pretty excited to have a starting point. Awesome. Well, that's kind of what I'm leaning to talk about here today is what makes up your inventory, why it's going to be challenging for a net zero strategy. Um, so I'm glad I didn't miss some key piece of publication that now, said you're already we, at net zero. <laughs> we don't have a website yet. Our, our yeah. office is actually very new. I mean, Jessica joined a month or two ago and uh, we just announced it, I think, uh, like 
formally internally just a, a, a month ago. So there is not a Office of Sustainability website or, or anything you're going to find it. <laughs> Got it. OK, here great. we are, Thank though. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. It's good to see. You. So, yeah, um, let's see. I figured, like I said, I figured I would give some context as to the impacts of the healthcare sector on a global stage, as well as discuss some of the unique challenges uh, you'll face in your, your commitment to come, specifically due to the majority of your emissions falling into the scope three category. Um, briefly, the, the differences between scope one, two, and three. Um, scope one emissions are those that are directly under your operational control. So this can vary by sector depending on how you define operational control, but it's it's basically what's happening from directly what you're putting out there, you know, boilers you're operating or wastewater treatment or things like that. Scope two emissions are those which are associated with the generation of steam and electricity that you consume. So locally, scope one of energy would be Oshner scope two, proportionate to the amount of uh, energy's power that you consume, right? And then scope three broadly is, I mean, <laughs> easily everything else. Uh, your scope three emissions will be someone else's scope one or scope two emissions by definition. So uh, generally, Oshner's journey to net zero in consideration of your scope one and two emissions will look similar to most other industries. You can electrify any equipment running off hydrocarbons. You can improve maintenance or leak rates of refrigerants or ozone. Just like the city of New Orleans for scope two, you'll leverage the transformation of Louisiana's energy mix to renewables. Um, even though you'll be electrifying equipment and increasing consumption, that power would be coming from a renewable energy source. So overall decreasing your emissions. Scope three is where it gets very interesting for healthcare, though. Um, I mean, really, we, we've done scope three for many different clients, and it's it's always interesting. But <laughs> um, science based reduction targets uh, are a critical piece to your net zero strategy. And the initiative itself of SBTI requires any applicants claiming to have an SBTI uh, or a net zero strategy to include scope three reduction pathways if scope three emissions make up more than 40% of your inventory. So if they didn't, you wouldn't have to worry about it, but uh, it will for Oshner, it does for healthcare. Um, for healthcare have, providers- Have you had healthcare sure. clients that you've done scope three analysis for yet? I'd have to check, we we haven't locally, but I know we- Yeah. So actually the, the sustainability lead for J&J &J works for ERM now, and his focus is supply chain sustainability. So um, I'd have to check, but I can get back to you on that. Most of them have been oil and gas chemical for, for me personally. Yeah, and our, our baseline is just focused on scope one and two, really. Um, yep. We might get a touch of three, but I don't I don't think I don't think we'll get much. Yep, fair enough. So. Uh, for healthcare providers like Oshner, your reduction pathways are going to be driven in large part by stakeholder engagement of your suppliers upstream of your operations. So questions like how green or eco-friendly or carbon intensive are your medicine providers, um, their transportation processes, their packaging, things like that. Um, in some instances, you may have competing drug providers, which will give you leverage to shop for the best option. Uh, same thing with you know, different consumables in, in hospitals and things, but in others, you may be limited. Um, so for speciality medicines, for speciality medic, medis, excuse me, medical device providers or other such niche situations where your pool of suppliers is limited, you may be stuck with what's available no matter how carbon intensive your partner's processes are. Um, so a net zero plan for your for, for Oshner and for the industry will likely turn out to be heavily reliant on creative approaches such as natural climate solutions, CCS, carbon crediting, or other offset approaches that work for your company, simply because you're limited in that control of scope three supply chain emissions by a market that may be monopolized or a market that's based on proprietary materials. Um, there but are many a market innovative... that is oh, go ahead. public in Fortune 500, yeah. and if they, I mean, if, if, if the SEC ever goes live with their their new disclosures. Um, a lot of our vendors are public and large. And so I think if we wait a little bit on to, to see how they're regulated, that will benefit mm -hmm. us. So there are yep. some some enablers that the SEC can Absolutely. push their yeah. stuff over the finish line. Yeah. And I can tell you from an inside track that that is trending into a positive outlook for for, you know, angles like that. 
So uh, there, there's many innovative solutions underway to track and offset scope three emissions uh, from first of their kind partnerships. So a fun one I can share is I was recently in Miami with the Popeye sustainability team um, who for the first time is working with their upstream farmers to reduce environmental impact. So really um, going beyond your own industry, industry company services provided and speaking to the people that enable you, you know, upstream medical providers, things like that, and talking about how you can work together to to do better things. And then outside of strategic partnerships, um, lots of different evolving technologies, such as blockchain for tracking of raw, raw, raw materials. We've seen this in the agricultural industry. Um, so, you know, scope three is a big problem. It's very uh, specific to what's influencing your supply chain, but there's lots of creative things being done um, to offset it. Yeah, I'll share just one thing. We um... sure. We're, we have a new uh, manufacturing site um, that we're going to be making our own gloves. And um, so we we're even partnering potentially buying a nitro plant. So we're, we're trying to um, bring some of that, those supplies that are disrupted and also um, fraught with uh, human rights violations local um, for, you know, economic development, but also supply resiliency and it'll, you know, really decrease carbon emissions. So we do have one really cool, innovative um you know, new new uh, opportunity online uh, for that scope three bucket. Yeah, that's great. Bringing it under your umbrella and control. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and I think we'll do a lot more of things like that for critical supplies. Great. So I know this was brief. Uh, I'd like to end just by emphasizing some of the most important elements of a net zero strategy. So up until now, I think I've, I've been trying to set the baseline of where both the city and Oshner stands in terms of net zero. Um, but I've put some references on the screen and we'll share this slide deck. Um, and the one on the right may be particularly useful for the city regarding organic waste. That's why I've left this little bit of the pyramid here. We can talk about that later. But um, at COP back in November, Catherine McKenna, who was Canada's former Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and then later Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, um, she was part of a group of 16 other experts forming the high level expert group of the net zero emissions committees for non state entities. Um, this was the UN's initiative to launch uh, first of its kind official report that sets out the five principles that should guide not only setting but attaining net zero targets. Additionally, it has um, 10 different recommendations or highlights for net zero committers, um, which should be considered through each stage of their progress towards being net zero. So, you know, um, Sarah, you guys with getting your inventory together, that's the very first piece of announcing a net zero pledge, right? So this, these pieces on the screen walk through all of the different pieces of a net zero journey to make it credible and defensible and Really, this is the very first time that the United Nations have ever, has ever put the words greenwashing into a document they published. But basically, the intent is to lay out rules and principles that would al allow the transparency level and robust science needed that people can't say you're greenwashing, right? Like if you follow these 10 principles, you're not faking it and just making empty promises. So very important, concise, and I think it's only like 50 pages. It's very, you know, powerfully and concisely written. So I would highly recommend that for anyone um, that's interested. So I found it, uh, I, I just want to talk a bit more about it. So from a personal perspective, I read it coming from the lens of, because, you know, we're doing this for so many clients and, countries and things, I read it coming from the lens of how can the legitimacy of my client's net zero actions be challenged? And in two ways, it was very informative to me. So um, I hadn't thought of some of the ways in which the report challenges these things and tells you how to combat them. Yeah. And then it also has some good practices to promote integrity from a reputable source. So not only is it, a, a powerful piece of literature to guide you. It's it's also very powerful in that this is what a team of 17 United Nations professionals think is the most important things you have. So the list in itself is extremely valuable. So oops. it doesn't matter. So anyway, this is just the last slide here. Um, so I hope you found this valuable. I know it was a whirlwind. We we have 7,000 folks globally in ERM. There's around 50 of us sitting over here in Lakeway. 
Um, so we we know the community well, we know the regulatory landscape, but we also have that global uh, perspective sitting on many international boards and regulatory standards as co-authors and authors. Uh, the firm is 50 years old, so we are well established and grew up in environmental regulatory compliance, but have been uh, in, in recent years recognized as a global leader for uh, all different aspects of sustainability. Put a few of these on the on the slide here, but um, you know, kind of to end, we we work in everything in sustainability and we work in every industry in healthcare. I mean, sorry, including healthcare and cities. So if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out.